Th thank you very much, Pamela. And, um, you know, I think I would know by now not to follow a social entrepreneur up onto the podium. <laughs> Soraya, thank you. That was, that was truly wonderful. And what a great forum we've had, haven't we? <laughs> From the uh, powerful storytelling on the first night of Ken Brecker to uh, Katie Tunstall last night, uh, the um, wonderful celebration of our social entrepreneurs class of 2009, and now the wisdom of Soraya and Lord Putnam. Uh, thank you all very much. This has been great. Um, over the last few days, we've been informed, we've been inspired, and we've been challenged. In some cases, we've been frightened, and rightfully so. So what can I add in these last few minutes of the forum? Um, I can talk about the trip that Sally Osberg and I made to the rainforest late last year and show video of us slogging through the jungle set to a bossa nova beat. <laughs> but I don't know that that would cut it. Um, but that trip did reinforce two issues that are very relevant today, urgency and hope. Urgency is on an upward path. We've made some progress on the big challenges in the world, but each passing day raises the stakes, and the economic crisis makes it just that much harder. But hope is on an upward path too. After a long drought, we finally have the potential for significant US engagement on the critical social and environmental issues that affect us all. And we're approaching an inflection point. There are forces coming together, evolutionary and revolutionary, that will shape how we move forward, both in the field of social entrepreneurship and in the field of social change more broadly. Last month was the bicentennial of the birth of Charles Darwin. There's been a lot written about Darwin and his impact on science, religion, and society. But there's a perspective about Darwin that provides an interesting parallel to where social entrepreneurship is today. Darwin took 30 years between the voyage of the Beagle and the publication of Origin of Species. He was collecting samples, researching, testing ideas, and the book created huge debates between the scientists and the church, and not to mention the general public. This debate went on for many years because the scientific explanation of exactly how physical variations were passed from generation to generation didn't exist. It took a revolutionary discovery in genetics in 1953, the DNA double helix, to provide the hard scientific evidence to support Darwin's theory. It took this revolutionary, exogenous factor to fully validate what Darwin had conjectured. A similar process is at play in social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship has been around for many years. Uh, Florence Nightingale and Maria Montessori were historical social entrepreneurs, and the term was first used in academic literature in the 60s and 70s, and then popularized by folks like Bill Drayton and Charlie Leadbeater in the, in the 80s. The Grameen Bank, the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, Youth Build, and Graham Vikas have all been around for 30 years or more. The field of social entrepreneurship has evolved, expanded, and strengthened over those three decades. Now, there's a revolutionary exogenous shock that may well propel social entrepreneurship into the mainstream, like the discovery of DNA did for the theory of evolution, the economic crisis could solidify social entrepreneurship as the most compelling model for social change. The economic crisis is forcing a rethink of the role of corporations, government, and social sector organizations. It's leading to interesting new questions. Are incentives solely based on profit good enough? Can companies ignore the social and environmental impacts they have and still hope to succeed? Is business as usual still the right course of business? And it seems clear to me that the answer to that last question is no, we can't go about business as usual. And while we don't know exactly how the economic meltdown is gonna play out, it does seem clear that social entrepreneurs are positioned to emerge from this crisis not only as survivors, but also as leaders. And I'll come back to that in, in a minute. 
Um, the world today is a scary place. There are a number of real threats that could render all of our work obsolete in as little as a few years or a few decades. Uh, one of these threats, as we all know, is climate change, and we were privileged to have the perspective of Dr. Patuari last night. There are many social entrepreneurs working on climate. Uh, Mindy Luber and Ceres are working with the biggest names in corporate America and the financial sector to fight climate change. Mark Plotkin and Liliana Madrigal of the Amazon conservation team and Martine von Hildebrand of Guy Amazonas are making huge strides to protect the rainforest. Michael Eckhart of ACOR and Mathis Wackernagel and Susan Burns of Global Footprint Network are approaching climate change with research networks and advocacy and Bunker Roy and others have developed community-based solutions. The list goes on. But the scope of the challenge is huge and literally the, the threat is hanging over our heads. Um, even hopes of uh, intervention from above don't sound like they're gonna work. Uh, echoing um, the quote that Lord Putnam did of the Archbishop of Canterbury, just yesterday, just yesterday, <laughs> uh, just yesterday, the Archbishop said, when it comes to climate change, God will not guarantee a happy ending. <laughs> so I think we need to consider some additional ways to make a difference via direct action, education, through policy, uh, the Skoll Foundation has been supporting the Alliance for Climate Protection in America to make climate change a priority issue. And we've also announced this week a major partnership with Avena to protect the Amazon rainforest. But the challenge is vast. Uh, water scarcity is another threat. Nearly one billion people don't have access to clean drinking water and some two and a half billion don't have adequate sanitation. And it's predominantly children and the disadvantaged who are impacted. I'm encouraged by the work of people like Gary White of Water Partners International, one of our social awardees this year, who's bringing together microfinance and water delivery in an attempt to address this challenge. Ceres has joined the Pacific Institute to link water resources and climate change. IDE India and Kickstart and Graham Vikas and many of you here are working on water concerns. But we continue to fall behind globally rapid industrialization and urbanization, and climate change are making the problem more difficult. And these challenges aren't limit, limited just to the environmental arena, others are political. The threat of nuclear proliferation is serious and growing. Bruce Blair of the World Security Institute has created the Global Zero Initiative to deal with nuclear disarmament. But with countries like North Korea and Iran gaining weapons, and Russia and the US still on hair trigger alert, none of us are safe. The Middle East also continues to be a flashpoint for conflict with the potential to embroil the whole world. So support for regional groups like the PeaceWorks Foundation and Search for Common Ground, Echo Peace, Friends of the Middle East, Friends of the Earth Middle East, and Soraya's Injaz Al Arab is vitally important, but we still need to do more. And just when you thought there was no more, um, pandemics. Uh, pandemics <laughs> ignore <laughs> politics, policies, and pundits, and how viruses, how viruses jump from animals to humans isn't well understood. So the work of folks like Nathan Wolf, who started the Global Viral Forecasting Initiative, is also vitally important. We need to confront those urgent threats, climate change, Middle East peace, water scarcity, pandemics, and uh, nuclear proliferation to protect the world of today long enough so that we can thrive tomorrow. And don't worry, this gets more positive. <laughs> um, the economic crisis, of course, complicates all of this. But the crisis also presents an opportunity. I looked up crisis in the dictionary, and one of the definitions is an unstable or crucial time in which a decisive change is impending. So by any definition, we're in a crisis, but that crisis not only implies instability, but also decisive change. And the entire world is in the process of trying to figure out how to maximize its resources. And this isn't a short-term tactical move, it's a change at the global DNA level. The crisis has made it clear that exponential consumption is no longer viable. The ability to do more with less 
has become an evolutionary advantage. And those species that do well at that will thrive. Well, social entrepreneurs are defined by their creativity, including their ability to produce results with limited resources. You are a keystone species in the social change architecture. You have a disproportionate effect on the world relative to your numbers, and your role and your importance will only be strengthened by the economic crisis. And this isn't just speculation on my part. Um, some social entrepreneurs are already seeing new resources flowing their way. Uh, Youth Build USA, run by social entrepreneur Dorothy Stoneman, has already seen a $50 million increase in funding written into the re recent stimulus package passed in the US. So why will social entrepreneurs lead the way in the current downturn? Because producing results with limited resources is all about leverage. And leverage is about looking at your assets and figuring out what asset can best be used to meet objectives. And social entrepreneurs are masters at this. For example, one, uh, one source of leverage that I find works well is storytelling through film. As you've seen these films today and the films we saw yesterday, um, they really can affect a, a, a broad range of people very quickly. And when, when we did the film An Inconvenient Truth a few years back, it helped fundamentally change the conversation around climate around the world. It helped Al Gore take his message that he'd been telling to 50 or 100 people at a time to a much broader audience more quickly. And obviously not everyone has access to film, but a number of social entrepreneurs now are using video and film to great effect, helping them tell their story more broadly. It's something we support at the School Foundation through our Uncommon Heroes short films um, and with our partnerships with the Sundance Institute and PBS and others. Another way to maximize leverage is through collaboration. In tough times, social entrepreneurs can gain a lot from working with each other. For example, uh, Paul Farmer of Partners in Health has been talking with Matt Flannery and Pramel Shah about using Kiva to support community workers in Rwanda and elsewhere. CAMFED has been working with Kickstart and ID India and Global Footprint Network and others to teach rural women in Zambia. Fundacion Paraguaya has become a microfinance partner with Kiva, and the list goes on. So media and partnerships are two great ways to find leverage, and I suspect you've come up with many others just in the last few days. We're in a unique period of history. We face big challenges, and we need big ideas. Many of you are delivering these big ideas. Social entrepreneurs are the antidote to the current pessimism. People need good stories in times like this, and you all have the best stories. We arrived in Oxford this week in the grips of financial despair and mounting social unease. The challenges loom large before us, and yet, as always, we leave Oxford with a rene renewed sense of what's possible. Last year, I claimed that social entrepreneurs had arrived. Now it's time for the next step in our evolution. Now it's time for social entrepreneurs to lead. It's time for social entrepreneurs to take that next step forward and show the way for the rest of the world. After all, as one economist, and I shudder to end on a quote from an economist, <laughs> but as the economist Paul Romer famously stated, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So thank you all very much. <laughs>